Of all of the doctrinal difficulties within Scripture, arguably the, some of the most difficult or at least the most contentious doctrines are that of the Christian's relationship to the law and the Christian's relationship to the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit's work in the life of the believer. And as we've seen, Galatians deals with them both. As we've worked through this letter, we've gone back and forth with both the law and the Spirit, and today we're returning again to the Holy Spirit. A biblical understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does is a needed corrective in contemporary Christianity. Many evangelicals see the Spirit as some sort of divine genie who dispels energy and makes Christians do bizarre things under the guise of gifting. But what Paul writes in our text today takes us to the very central role of the Spirit in our lives. When we think about what is, the, what is the Spirit's purpose, why do we have the Holy Spirit, what's His chief ministry in the life of the believer, our text takes us into the very heart of the matter because as we study Scripture, we come to the understanding that the Holy Spirit's chief purpose, what He's all about, is glorifying Christ. And this morning in Galatians 4, 20, or 5, 24 through 25, we're going to see the Holy Spirit's role of glorifying Christ specifically by making you, and I, making you and I more like Christ in holiness. So you have your Bibles open to Galatians chapter 5. Look with me at verse 24 and verse 25. Paul writes this, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let's pray, and then we'll look at these two verses this morning. Father, as we approach these passages and this concept of crucifixion and conformity to your Son through your Spirit, so we talk about holiness and the, and the need for your people to be more like your son. I ask that you would give us a clear mind, that through your spirit you would drive this text deep within us to our hearts, that we would go forth from here resolute to kill the sin that is in our lives and to keep in step with the spirit. Make your word plain this morning and keep the messenger out of the way of the message. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in Galatians 5, we've been exploring our freedom in Jesus. True freedom, we've seen, is life in the Spirit. And life in the Spirit means that we have been freed to serve our brothers and sisters. Life in the Spirit means that we are free from the oppressive rule or the oppressive domain of the flesh. As we walk by the Spirit, As we follow his lead, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. True Christians are characterized not by the works of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit. We saw last time that we were in Galatians 5 that Christ-likeness is produced in us not by law, but by the Spirit. Now, Paul brings the whole discussion of the flesh and the spirit to a close by expressing the reality of our being crucified to the flesh and our being conformed to Christ by the spirit. So let's look at verse 24 then as we consider this idea of crucifying the flesh. Paul says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Earlier in chapter 5, Paul introduced the reality of spiritual warfare, that inner struggle that every single one of us, assuming you're a Christian, every true believer endures. It's that internal tension of, on the one hand, the pulling of the flesh, and on the other hand, the leading of the spirit. This idea of doing and wanting to do, craving even, wrong things, but knowing we shouldn't. In verse 16, Paul makes clear that if we walk by the Spirit, 
we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So you have this real reality in our lives as Christians that you, who you feed is, is what you will become in a sense. If you give way to your flesh and constantly sin, then you're going to be stifling the Spirit in your life. And the opposite is true as well. As if you're following the Spirit's lead and, and doing what you're supposed to be doing, sin will diminish in your life. Now, after contrasting the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit, Paul gives this summary statement in our passage this morning. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That he specifies those who belong to Jesus makes clear that who he's talking about in this text, who he has in mind, are believers. He's talking about true Christians. It is the children of God. It is those who are part of his family, part of his people, those who belong to him. They are the ones who have crucified the flesh. Obviously, the key word here in verse 24 is this word crucify. What does that mean? It's from the Greek stratuo, which means to fasten to a cross, literally to crucify. Crucify is a obviously strong word. It's a word that's centered on violence and death. Paul could have just easily have said that those who belong to Jesus have killed their flesh. He could have said they put their flesh to death, but that's not what he says. Instead, he says that Christians have crucified the flesh. That's intentional. It's a word choice that's meant to communicate a picture, that picture being crucifixion, that picture being the cross, that picture being Jesus on the cross. And as we're going to see in a moment, this is all strategic on the Apostle Paul's part. Well, what are we crucifying as Christians? Look what he says. We're crucifying the flesh. And not just the flesh, but the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, when Paul mentions the flesh here, what he has in mind are those sinful remnants of the old life. Those sinful urges and desires that are that our old self tugs and pulls at us. So, so you, you want to sin, you crave sin, you desire to do what's wrong. What is that? That's the flesh. It's the flesh. Uh, J.C. Ryle describes the flesh within the Christian this way. He says, even after conversion, he, that's the Christian, he carries within him a nature prone to evil, a heart weak and unstable as water. That heart will never be free from imperfection in this world, and it is a miserable delusion to expect it. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the flesh. We're talking about that old nature within you that is prone to evil. That, that nature within you, that, heart weak, that, that weak heart, that unstable heart. It, it's, it's the person that's responsible for all the wrong things that you do. Talking about yourself. You know that meme with Obi-Wan Kenobi? Um, have you seen this around where it's uh, from the original Star Wars? And it's, you know, the, do you know Ben Kenobi? He said, oh, of course I know him. It's me. <laughs> and you see that the same idea. It's like, who, who's responsible for everything wrong in my life? Oh, it's me. That's who. <laughs> That's the idea, okay? All of your stumbling and sin, all of your being prone to do what you don't want to do, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the flesh. It's that remnant. It's the remaining old nature within you. Now, notice that Paul specifies not just the flesh, but the flesh with its passions, the flesh with its desires. The word for passions here is the word pathema, which, has that, which, which means literally the inward experience of an affective nature. What we're talking about here are our feelings, sinful feelings, that internal pull, that in, internal feeling, that internal interest in sin. He says, Paul says we need to crucify the flesh with its passions, those sinful feelings, but also its desires. Epithemia is the word, which is specifically a desire for something forbidden. Lust could be translated here. It's 
Craving, when we talk about fleshly desires, what we mean is the craving for that which is wrong. So when we're talking about the flesh with its passions and with its desires, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about that old part of us that still loves and longs for sin. We're talking about that reality that we sing about in the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, where we say, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. What is that? It's the flesh. And surprisingly, Paul says that those who belong to Jesus have nailed that flesh with its passions and desires to the cross. We've crucified it. Now, earlier I stated that when Paul writes that Christians have crucified the flesh, he is intentionally and strategically directing, orienting, pointing our minds to the cross. He does so because fixation on the cross, looking at Jesus on the cross, contemplating crucifixion is one of the chief means to wage war against the sin in your life. Three times in this letter, the Apostle Paul directly connects the idea of crucifixion with Christian living. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 5.24, our passage this morning. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The third instance where Paul connects the crucifixion of Christ with Christian living is in the next chapter, chapter 6, verse 14, where Paul says, Far be it for me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So for the Apostle Paul, as he is contemplating living the Christian life and being separated from the world and having a newfound identity and not giving way to the flesh with its passions and desires, central in Paul's mind is the cross of Christ. Jesus Christ crucified. For Paul, that changes everything. And it's not just something that we look back to. It's something that we continue to look to. It's something that defines our Christian experience. Paul isn't connecting Christian living with the cross to be cool or to be edgy. There is a profound, life-changing reality that is here for us. I once was on staff with a pastor who prided himself in the fact that there was not a single cross within the church building. He said, we, 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 don't, we intentionally design our building to look nothing like a church. We don't want people to feel icky when they come in. We, and and we, we, are not, we are intentionally not having crosses up around here. This same pastor told me that I'm fixated, me, <laughs> I'm fixated or obsessed with the cross of Christ. This pastor told me that he hated the way I led communion because I made it about the death of Jesus. And this was a preposterous thing for a pastor to say, in my opinion. Because when you read the book of Acts, the apostles again and again preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. The apostle Paul told the Corinthians, I knew nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In, 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 in 1 Corinthians 11, when we take the Lord's Supper, later, which we're going to do later on today, Jesus says what? Or Paul says what? As we partake the elements, we're proclaiming the death of Jesus like, like Christians are fixated on the cross. We're all about the cross. I mean, that's why we have two of them. One right there, one right there. <laughs> it's not just to be cool or edgy. It's not to just have decorations in our building. It's because as Christians, we are a cross-centered, cross-oriented people. The cross, the cross and the, and the grave, the, the death of Jesus and the resurrection from the tomb. These define our Christian experience. We talked about this last week. How we die with Jesus and we're resurrected again with him. How we, we have resurrection power in our lives. But for the Apostle Paul, the cross was everything. For the early apostles, the cross was everything. 
And any Christian minister worth his weight, the cross will be central in his life, in his experience, and in his preaching. For the Apostle Paul, the death of Jesus directly, directly impacts our crucifying the flesh with its passions and desires. And I want you to see this, and we're going to spend a few minutes working through it, but turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, where we see one of the plainest and clearest teachings about the connection of the death of Jesus in our own fight against sin. Now, you have your Bibles open to Romans 6. I want you, first of all, to look at verse 12 and 13. Because often when pastors uh, preach against the presence of sin in the life of the believer, this is where they start. They start with this command. Look at verse 12 and 13. Paul writes, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Now, this is initially simple and straightforward, isn't it? Paul's command to the Christian is, don't let sin rule over you. Don't obey it. Don't present your members, don't present your body, don't present your faculties to be used by sin. Instead, allow yourself to be used by for righteousness. That's a simple command. That's a straightforward command, but it is an incredibly difficult command. It's an impossible one, really. Uh, how many of you have tried this? You hear, you hear a sermon, you go to revival meeting, you, you come back from camp, whatever, and, and you're convicted about sin, and you say, I, I'm going to do better. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to pray harder. I'm going to be holier harder, Right? What happens? Lasts for a couple days, maybe a week, and you're right back at it. This is every experience of a Christian teenager is coming back from a week at camp. You know, a week at camp, you're separated from the world. You're attending like a million services a day. You're surrounded by other Christians. You're having times of prayer and Bible reading, and you're just resolved. I'm going to go back. I'm going to take the world by the horns. But then you're back in the old world, or in the real world, and you fail, and it's back to the same old habits. This is the experience of you hearing a powerful sermon, determining that you're going to read your Bible every day. You're going to get serious about church. You're going to be done with sin. And then what happens? You sleep in one Sunday, and that's it. You don't feel like going to church you fall. Now look again at verse 12, Romans 6. Follow along with me as I read. Paul says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. It is not incidental that Paul says, therefore. That's huge. That means that the command given, don't let sin reign in your body. Don't give yourself to sin. This command in verse 20, 12 and 13 is the result or the conclusion of something else. Therefore, anytime you read a therefore in your Bible, you got to ask yourself, what's that therefore? What's, what's, what's it there for? <laughs> Why is it there? Well, this is the conclusion, verse 12 and 13. Don't let sin reign. So, so there's something, the, the command not to sin is hinging on something else. Well, what is that? Well, we got to do some groundwork here before we get to this command. And that's found in verse 1, beginning to be found in verse 1, rather. So you're looking at verse 12 and 13 of Romans 6. Go up to verse 1. What shall we say then, Paul says? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? We've been forgiven. We, we, ha we live under grace, right? We don't live under law. We live under grace. Does that mean then I can just do whatever I want? I can sin. Because the more I sin, the more grace is going to abound, right? Paul says, verse 2, by no means. Or if you grew up reading the King James, God forbid. It's a strong word. 
He says, by no means, or God forbid, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What Paul is detailing here is that we should not continue to sin, even though we have an infinity, an infinite supply of grace. Our, our instinct should not be, oh, well, I'm going to sin so that way God's grace may abound. That's not it. Why? Because we've been united to Jesus. That's what it means to be baptized into Jesus. When you become a Christian, Jesus' death becomes your death. Jesus' resurrection becomes your resurrection. You're united to him and you're in him and he's in you. You're one with him. You've been immersed in him. One of Martin Luther's favorite analogies of this idea of union with Christ was the principle of marriage. And again, this, this is not an extra biblical conclusion because Christians are called the bride of Christ. But, but Luther loved to talk about horse, like you and me, who live a, a whorish life on the streets, become prostitutes. We're, we're prostitutes, what we are. We're dirty. We're filthy. And the king comes along and he saves us. And he doesn't just save us, he marries us. And he takes dirty, whorish prostitutes like us and he removes us from the streets and, and welcomes us into his home. And what belongs to him now becomes ours. And what we have becomes his. And, and do you see how unbalanced that is? Like, like what do we bring to the table? Filth, sin, guilt. What does he bring to the table? Everything. He brings the table, <laughs> the house, the food, the tables, the clothes, everything. And you have this exchange where what, what is his becomes ours and what's ours becomes his. And, and that's a beautiful picture. That, that's exactly right. You know, when you get married, you make this vow. Uh, I, I, it, you know, Val and I are, are, are kind of nerds. And so when, if you were at our, our wedding, you'll recall that we did, uh, we were very intentional about having our service follow exactly uh, the book of common prayer. Uh, straight down, not the 1621 edition, mind you. Uh, we wanted the original Burbage from Thomas Cranmer from the 1500s. And if you recall, there's a line in there because everyone said, What? You know, everyone chuckled at the line, with my body I thee worship. But there, but there is a line in, in the vows where it says, I pledge thee my troth. You remember this? What, what is that? That's, that's all my worldly goods. That's everything. So what, what is mine becomes vows. And what is vows becomes mine. That's what happens in marriage. You're, all of your worldly goods, everything that you have, you, you combine them. They're yours. And, and so it is when we become Christians that God strangely, incredibly, graciously in this marriage relationship, as he unites us with himself, he takes our filthiness and he gives us his righteousness. We bring death, he gives life. So the death of Jesus becomes our death. The resurrection of Jesus becomes our resurrection. Now look at verse 5 through 11 of Romans 6, because here is the interpretational key. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin, now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Do you see how this fundamentally changes everything for us? 
Because we've been united to Jesus, his death becomes our death. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. So what that means then is we're no longer dead to sin's power. Or we're now dead to sin's power, rather. If you're a Christian then, sin no longer controls you. Sin no longer dominates you. Sin is no longer your master. You're dead to it. It's been crucified. And now you're being dead to sin. You're alive to Jesus. You now love and live to God. In that same analogy that Luther gives about the whore who becomes the bride of the king, he talks about how the prostitute will still have whorish ways. She will still, there's going to be time frame for her to learn her new role, to live out her new identity. She, she's accustomed to life on the streets. And it's going to take newfound practice and new training on her part to become a woman of the court, to, to be comfortable uh, in, a, in a regal dress, to, to learn how to walk and talk like a lady. Uh, think, um, you know, what's that movie with Julie Roberts? Pretty woman, yeah. I've never seen it, but I, I hear this is the general gist of it. Or think of, you know, um, Anne Hathaway, Princess Diaries, right? She's just, you know, she doesn't, even, she doesn't know how to do the little, you know, little waves, the little, she looks like a mess, but, you know, she's a, she's a princess or a queen or whatever. I don't know, I straight watch it. You know, this is the idea, right? Like, she has to live in light of her newfound reality, her newfound identity, and that's the joke, right? Because she's not that way. She's not elegance and grace, um, and, and she has to learn that. And so it is so with you and I. The reality, the point is, here's what I'm trying to get across. The reality has changed. We're dead to sin. Now, you and I still, we, 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 we're inconsistent. We still fall. We don't live in light of that reality. But that doesn't change the fact that that is reality. That doesn't change the fact that sin's power has been broken. If we choose to still continue to sin, that's just being inconsistent with our newfound position, our newfound identity in Christ. So Paul says in verse 11 here, you need to consider, you need to reckon, you need to actually think to yourself, I am dead to sin, but alive to God. You and I were in the prison of sin. We were shackled. Jesus came into the prison. He knocked down the wall. He broke the chains. And now you and I need to live in light of that reality of freedom. The chains are broken. They won't hold you down anymore if you pull them off. The wall is gone. You can see the sun. You can smell the air. You're not trapped in the cell anymore. Now, you could stay there, and you could keep the chains on you and never leave the cell, but that would be dumb. Who would do such a thing? Take the chains off and walk out. That's what Paul is saying here. Live in reality of your newfound life. Live in the light of your newfound freedom. What is that freedom? Death to sin, life to God. And it's at this point that Paul then gives the command that we started off in Romans 6. Because of this, because you are free, because you're no longer dead, because you're no longer bound, now don't let sin reign over you. Don't let sin dominate you. Don't let sin keep you in your chains. You are free. Turn back to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. What Romans 6 has made clear is the reality of our union with Jesus. We no longer live under the dominion of sin. We no longer live ruled by the flesh. Because we've been united to Jesus, we are dead to sin and dead to the flesh, and we are alive to Jesus by the Spirit. So look what Paul says in verse 24 again. He says that those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Because of our union with Jesus, remember, we just read this, Romans 6, his death becomes our death, his crucifixion, our crucifixion. Sin has been crucified. It's been put to death. It's been given a death blow. And yet, all of us still feel the pull of the flesh, don't we? 
So while the flesh has been crucified, there still remains work to be done for you and me. There is still crucifying to be done. Though our flesh has been given the death blow, you and I must still wage war against it. We must still crucify it. When you, in fact, when you parse the tense of the, word, the verb crucify here, it's an aorist active indicative. And what that means is that it's a past event with present implications. That's what that means. So we could say this. Though the flesh has been given the death blow, it has not yet been totally destroyed. Its power has been broken, but it has not been bested. What this means then is that you and I must actively, daily be doing the work of crucifying the flesh with its sinful passions and desires. We must be daily waging war and killing our sins. In his classic work, The Mortification of Sin, John Owen writes these words. He asks us, do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? You must always be killing, be at it while you live. Do not take a day off from this work. Always be killing sin or it will be killing you. And of course, by mortification here, what Owen is dealing with is the language that Paul uses in Romans 8.13, which really is a parallel text to Galatians 5.24. Paul in Romans 8.13 says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And that's what Owen has by that word, that terminology of mortify, killing, putting to death, putting to death the sin in our life. The Mortification of Sin was published in 1656, which, uh, for those of you who struggle with history, that's uh, predating our country by over 100 years. And like many of the Puritan writings, Mortification of Sin is timeless truth because like the best of the Puritans, Owen is simply just teaching the Bible. Uh, The Mortification of Sin has been one of the most helpful little books that I personally have read and and have benefited from in understanding my own sin and how to fight against it. So I I want to recommend to you the mortification of sin. And specifically, I meant to bring it, but I forgot it. Specifically, the Banner of Truth edition, the Puritan paperback Banner of Truth. It's like eight bucks. And the reason why I'm recommending that specific edition is because uh, Owen is notoriously difficult to read. And what what the publisher has done is they've edited and lightly, lightly abridged. I'm a purist. I don't like abridgments. I like the real deal. (laughs) But they've lightly abridged Owen to make him a little bit more understandable. And and I want you to read that uh, because it's going to help you in your fighting against sin. Now, if you're wanting the, re- the raw Owen, the unabridged Owen. Uh, Crossway is publishing a new edition of The Mortification of Sin later this month, so keep your eye out for that. At any rate, what I want to do is I, wanna, I want to engage with The Mortification of Sin and give to you some of what Owen recommends. And this is so helpful. It's that if you have a bulletin, it's in your handout. First of all, this is so, this is so, so crystal clear, so practical. In his work, Owen says what mortification is not. What is not killing sin in your life? He says to mortify a sin is not to utterly root it out and destroy it. Mortification is not just the changing of some outward aspects of sin. Mortification is not just the improvement of our natural constitution. A sin is not mortified when it's only diverted. Occasional victories over sin are not mortification. Okay, that's so, that's so helpful. Because as Christians, that's what we think killing sin in our life is. We think, well, I, I have to utterly root it out of my life. And that's killing sin. But then what happens? That's, that's, that's Christian camp, teenager. What happens? We sin again. And then we struggle. And then we lack assurance. Uh, you know, uh, Christians say, well, mortification is is changing outward aspects of sin. Growing up fundamentalist Baptist, this this was our bread and butter. So so what does that mean? 
Well, if you're a sinner, you wear a black hoodie and a black oversized pants, and you shop at Hot Topic, right? Then you become a Christian and you clean up. You put on a nice collar shirt, you cut your hair, you're wearing dockers, you, you look the part. You talk Christianese, and then you look externally clean. Some of the worst people I have known in my life looked squeaky clean and were some of the most vile, dirty people internally. Okay? So, so killing sin is not conforming externally. That's not it. Killing sin is not just improving a part of you. Man, I have a real problem with cussing, so I'm going to clean up my act. Boom, look, I just I vanquished sin. That's not it. Uh, a sin is not mortified when it's diverted. It's not exchanging one bad habit for another. See, these are, these are all ideas people have about killing sin. So Owen makes clear that's not what killing sin is. Then he gives us three ideas of what mortification is. What does it mean to kill sin? What does it mean to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires? Number one, mortification is a habitual weakening of the lust. Habitual habit. It's your habit of weakening your sinful cravings. Number two, a constant fight and contention against sin. Killing sin, in other words, is the act of actually waging war against the sin in your life. And number three, mortification is a degree of success in the battle, having some victory. Later in the book, Owen gives preparatory rules in mortifying sin in our lives. And, it, and it, first of all, it's this. Number one, unless a man is a true believer and grafted into Christ, he can never mortify a single sin. So in other words, you have to actually be a Christian to kill the sin in your life. If you're not a Christian, good luck. It's not going to happen. Number two, you cannot mortify a specific lust that is troubling, troubling you unless you are seeking to obey the Lord from the heart in all areas. That's huge. Some people have a lust problem and they can't vanquish it. They, they, can't, they can't climb over it. Why? Because they're not submissive and obedient to the Lord in other areas of their life. That's why. In other words, you can't be one of these half-hearted Christians who say, well, you know what? I have this sin. I really want to get rid of it, but I'm not taking seriously my own walk with the Lord. I'm not reading my Bible every day. I'm not praying every day. Church, hit or miss. I, it doesn't matter to me. I can worship the Lord from the golf course on the Sunday morning. See that? It all goes together, in other words. You can't mortify a specific lust that is troubling you unless you are seeking to obey the Lord from the heart in all areas. You're not going to kill sin in your life if you're half-heartedly pursuing your Christianity. It's not going to happen. Then, finally, Owen, Owen gives us nine preparatory directives in fighting against sin. You say, what are specifically things I can do right now to kill sin in my life? Here you go. Number one, consider the symptoms that accompany a lust. In Christian counseling, I always ask people, you know, if you're given to depression or porn addiction or alcohol addiction or compulsive lying, whatever your vice is, what is usually going on to lead you there? And there always are common things. You know, people who are depressed, well, they're fixating and focused on their life. What's going on? They're, 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 they're listening to all sorts of things that, that put them down into the dumps. So what do they do? Turn to alcohol, boom, ball in the pain. Well, what about porn addicts? Again, very simple. They're alone. They're up late at night. They're bored. They're wandering on their phone. Okay, so these are all symptoms that accompany lust. So how do, you, how do you fight that? Well, you have to think strategically and think to yourself, it's not good for me to be alone. It's not good for me to be up out late, late at night. If I'm prone to depression, maybe, just, just maybe, I should not be listening to emo music all day long because maybe it's bringing me down. You see that? There, there are things that we can do. Consider the symptoms that accompany a lust. Owen says, number two, get a clear and abiding sense upon your mind and conscience of the guilt, danger, and evil of the sin with which you're troubled. Like actually think, hey, if I do this, there are going to be consequences in my life. If I do this, I might lose my family. Think about that. Let that be your fantasy. Number three, charge your conscience with the guilt of indwelling sin. 
Like actually acknowledge what you're doing is wrong and feel it. Don't minimize it, like feel it. Christians don't like doing this. Christians like to be happy, slappy all the time, but that's not real life. And when you sin, Owen says, you need to actually feel the weight of that sin. Number four, seek a constant longing and thirsting to be delivered from the power of the sin. Number five, consider whether the trouble that you are perplexed with is related to your particular makeup and nature. That's so helpful. Some of us are prone to depression because we are more melancholy in spirit. That's me. I am not a happy, slappy person. Praise the Lord, you know, click my heels every day kind of thing. That's just not my natural makeup. I'm more cynical in nature. Uh, I, I, I am. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, I have to have the coffee flow in me to get that smile on this face. Okay, I'm not that kind of person. So, so my own nature, my own disposition is there are, there are certain hangups I have just a melancholy person. Therefore, am I prone, can, I be, can I be prone to depression? Yes. Yes, I can. For the longest time, Christmas was very sad to me. You know why it was sad? Because instead of thinking about all the joyful things, I think about how all the people, like all these people I grew up with are gone because they're dead. <laughs> okay, that's not, see, see what I'm saying? So Owen is saying you got to consider your own makeup and nature. Like, what are you like? Where do you fall short? Number six, consider what occasions your sin has taken advantage of to exert itself in the past and watch carefully at such times. In other words, there are certain things that are going to trip you up. Be on the lookout for them. Number seven, rise mightily against the first sign of sin. You feel that temptation in your heart to do whatever? Rise might. Don't, don't give into it. Fight against it hard. Throw your everything at it immediately. Number eight, we need to be exercised with such meditations as will fit us at all times with self-abasement and thoughts of our own vileness. So consider and think about what this does to you and what this turns you into and how this hurts your relationship with God. Number nine, when God stirs your heart about the guilt of your sin, concerning either its root in and dwelling or its breaking out, be careful you do not speak peace to yourself before God speaks. Listen closely to what he says to your soul. In other words, don't quickly excuse yourself. Confess your sin to God, repent, and ask him for forgiveness. We, we, do this, we do this process, like one of the reasons why we do the Lord's Supper the way that we do, which we're going to do, you know, in a few moments. One of the reasons why we do this is to help train you how to think about sin, how to think about what your sin costs, and then to fill it, and then give way to forgiveness. See that? That's why we, we have a time of silence. So you can think, man, like my sin costs the infinite Son of God the second member of, of, of the Godhead, to take on flesh and to die a death wherein his blood was shed for me. They stripped him naked on a cross. They tore his back to, to shreds for me. I did that. It was my sin that held him there. And you say, well, I don't really like thinking about that. Too bad. That's what we're supposed to do. And you think about it and you dwell on it. You ask God for forgiveness, and then, Romans 8, 1, then there is therefore no condemnation. You, 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 that repentance gives way to rejoicing. And so when we do Lord's Supper here, that's what we do. It's remembrance, it's repentance, and then we don't end somberly, we always end rejoicing. Thank you, God, for what you've done for me. Now, as I've read through this, and as I've been talking about warring against the flesh in your life, some of you may have been feeling very discouraged because when you think about sin and when you think about warfare in your life against sin, you just feel defeated a lot. A lot of times it seems like sin has a grip on us that won't let us go and we fall into the cycle where we sin, ask for forgiveness, resolve to do better, and then fall again. And, and, and you may be stuck in the cycle right now and you may be tempted just to throw up your hands and give up. Don't do that. 
And in this frustrating cycle, many believers question their salvation. I can't truly save because look at the mess I'm in. If I was a real Christian, then I would have victorious Christian living. I wouldn't be falling every single day like this. I wouldn't be repeating the same sin again and again and again. And it's at this point as believers, we have a a tight rope that we have to walk on. Because on the one hand, we can fall off the rope into soul-ruining error. And on the other hand, we can go into this this, this other side of being so introspective about the Christian life that we're paralyzed and can't do anything. So, so there's two extremes. You can blissfully go through, don't go through your life not acknowledging your sin at all, or you can become so introspective and your conscience so sensitive that you're like Martin Luther where you make a confession, you walk out and you have a dirty thought, you turn right back around and you're there all day long, okay? To the point where his... his uh, uh, what was, I forget his name, but anyway, his, the guy above him was like, you, you need to get out of here. <laughs> he kicked him out. He's like, you know what? Maybe the monastery life's for, not for you. You need to go teach in the college. And that's why Luther left because uh, you know, the guy was just so frustrated with him. Luther's spending 12 hours in the confessional. You need to go away. So Paul actually, on the one hand, he commands the Corinthians to examine whether or not they're saved. Do you know this? 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, Paul says, to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. There are many in evangelical Christianity, people who go to church, who have never before in their life thought, am I actually saved? They say, well, you know what my Bible here says, right here, that on July 6, 1995, I said some prayer. So that must mean I'm a Christian. Now, I've been living worse than the devil. I have a foul mouth and a foul life, but I said a prayer when I was three years old, therefore... I'm a Christian. No, no, no. They, they could use some introspection. They could use 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself whether you are in the faith. Test yourself, Paul says. Well, what's a good test? Do I go Google test of Christian, Christianity? No. Here's the test. We're in the book of Galatians, for goodness sake. Is your life dominated by the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit? When you consider your own life, are you saying, do you see yourself growing in love, growing in joy, growing in patience, growing in kindness? Or do you see yourself absolutely dominated by sensuality, dominated by sorcery, dominated by hatred, all of those works of the flesh? That's a good test. And we need to not be cavalier about this. I mean, Jesus himself warned in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, Jesus says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You workers of lawlessness. That's one of the most terrifying passages in the entire New Testament, in my opinion, because you have people who rightly identify Jesus as Lord. You're my master. They said, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do all of these mighty things for you? And Jesus' response to them is, depart from me. I don't even know you. Now, I'm not intending to rock your assurance this morning or to knock you out at the knees. The key phrase in that warning is when Jesus identifies them as the workers of lawlessness. You say, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a worker of lawlessness? Well, one of the most helpful descriptions of lawlessness and the genuineness of our salvation comes from the Apostle John in his first letter, 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 through 10 is one of the clearest and most concise contrasts of true and false faith. In 1 John 3, verse 4, John says this, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So going back to Matthew 7, Jesus says, Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What does that mean? According to 1 John 3, that's those who make a practice of lawlessness. Those who make a practice of sin. 1 John 3, 5, You know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Now no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. 
practicing lawlessness. What does that mean? It means you're characterized by sin. It means you're dominated by sin. It means that sin rules over you. We're not talking about falling into sin. We're not talking about stumbling into sin. What we're talking about is that sin is your Lord. Sin is your master. Sin is who you are and sin is what you do. If sin is your practice, that's what we mean. And what John says next is that if your practice is sin, if your practice is lawlessness, you're not a Christian. Verse 7 of 1 John 3. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. Now, commentators spill a lot of ink about trying to identify who, what that is, God's seed. It's really not that complicated. God's seed is God's spirit. That's it. God's spirit abides in you. And therefore, you're not going to, if God's spirit, who John here calls a seed, abides in you, what fruit are you going to bear? The fruit of the spirit. That's exactly right. You're not, if God's, if, if the spirit is the seed, you're not going to be bearing the works of the flesh. You're going to be bearing spiritual fruit, Holy Spirit fruit. That's why I said it's a good test. Works of the flesh, fruit of the spirit. Which one are you dominated by? And then John goes on very plainly in verse 10, saying this, by this, it is evident. By what? How we live. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Now understand what we're talking about here is not perfection. None of us are perfect. What we are talking about is direction. As John MacArthur says, it's not the practice, perfection of one's life, but the direction of a life that provides evidence of regeneration. None of us are perfect. All of us struggle. It's not the question of perfection, but direction. That's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Living in lawlessness or living in obedience. Frustration over sin and guilt and remorse for your sin is not an evidence of unbelief, but it's actually an evidence of belief. Did you know this? When you sin as a Christian and you feel guilt, some of you do, hopefully all of you do when you sin, feeling guilt, feeling dirty over your sin is not proof that you're not saved. In fact, feeling guilt over your sin is an indication that you are saved. Because if you feel guilt and feel dirty after sinning, that is proof that you're a Christian, or at least can be a proof that you actually belong to Jesus. Why? Because if you weren't a Christian, you wouldn't care. You would be totally numb to it. But the fact is when you lie or cheat or steal or whatever, and you feel something right here, that's called conviction, and that's good. Because conviction means you're alive, not dead. In his book, Holiness, J.C. Ryle warned against those who feel nothing. He says, let us take care that our own personal religion is real, genuine, and true. The saddest symptom about many so-called Christians is the utter absence of anything like conflict and fight in their Christianity. They eat, they drink, they dress, they work, they amuse themselves, they get money, they spend money, they go through a scanty round of formal religious services once or twice every week. But the great spiritual warfare, its watchings, its strugglings, its anxieties, its agonies, its battle and contests, all of this they appear to know nothing at all. Then he says, let us take care that this case is not our own. The worst state of the soul is when the strong man armed keepeth the house and his goods are at peace, which leads men and women captive to his will, then, and they make no resistance. The worst chains are those which are neither felt nor seen by the prisoner. So that's the warning. And then Ryle goes on to describe how, how the fight is proof of spiritual life. He says this, We may take comfort about our souls if we know anything of an inward fight and conflict. It is the invariable companion of genuine Christian holiness. It's not everything, I'm well aware, but it is something. Do we find in our, hearts, in our heart of hearts a spiritual struggle? 
Do we feel anything of the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that we cannot do the things that we would? Galatians 5, 17. Are we conscious of two principles within us contending for mastery? Do we feel anything of war in our inward man? Well, let us thank God for it. It is a good sign. It is strongly probable evidence of the great work of sanctification. All true saints are soldiers. Anything is better than apathy, stagnation, deadness, and indifference. We are in a better state than many. The most part of so-called Christians have no feeling at all. We are evidently no friends of Satan. Like the kings of this world, he wars not against his own subjects. The very fact that he assaults and should fill our minds, assaults us, should fill our minds with hope. I say again, let us take comfort. The child of God has two great marks about him. And of these two, we have one. He may be known by his inward warfare as well as his inward peace. So some of you have really sensitive consciences and you feel profound guilt at your sin. And your mind goes, well, maybe I'm not saved at all because I feel so guilty. Take heart because the feeling of the guilty is indication that you are part of his own because you actually care. Now, where you should be concerned is if you sin and you don't feel a thing. That's dangerous ground. But feeling something, conviction, that's good. That's a sign of life. So Christians must be crucifying the flesh. Now look at verse 25. So we consider conforming to the Spirit. Paul says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step by the Spirit. Paul says, if this is true, then this will be true. If we're alive because of the Spirit, and if you're a Christian, you are, then we must be keeping in step with the Spirit. What does that mean, to keep in step with the Spirit? The word here is stokeo, which means to be in line with a person or thing considered as standard for one's conduct. To hold to to agree with, to follow, to conform. The word of, the idea of keeping in step with means to fall into line with, to march alongside. He's stepping here, so are you. You're keeping in line with him. Romans 4.12, speaking of Abraham, may be best illustrative of the sense where Paul says, walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham walked. So in other words, when regarding the spirit, if we live in the spirit, then we should be conforming to him. We should be following along with him. We should be keeping in step with him. Well, what does that mean? That means when he convicts, we listen, we follow. Where he leads, we follow. Where he goes, we go. You see see how how this goes together? Killing sin, conforming to the Spirit? They they go hand in hand. They're, they're, They're two sides of the same coin. The Spirit wages war against sin in our life. So we we go to war with the sin in life. Crucify it. And as we are crucifying the flat the the flesh, as we are crucifying sinful passions, sinful cravings, we are keeping in step with him. We are following him in holiness. In in Galatians 5.16, Paul says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, these are all parallel concepts. They all kind of have the same idea, and that is simply following his lead. Jai Packer sums up the whole discussion this way. The Christian can and must mortify sin through the Spirit. He can and must walk in the Spirit in a steady course of godliness and good works. This means that he will stop doing certain things that he did before and that unconverted folks still do and that he will start doing other things instead. The desires of the Spirit felt in the believer's own spirit, that is, his consciousness, are to be followed, but the desires of the flesh are not to be indulged. The Christian's life must be one of righteousness as the expression of his repentance and his rebirth.
In summary then, right now, you and I as believers are united and alive in the Spirit. We're living by the Spirit. And as we kill the sin in our lives, or as Paul says here, crucify the flesh with its passions and its desires, we are conforming to the Spirit. We are following His lead. He is leading us, walking us into greater Christ-likeness, into greater holiness. That's the nine weeks that we spent in fruit of the Spirit. That's what holiness is. That's what Christ-likeness is. And the Spirit is leading us along this path into greater holiness and a greater Christ-likeness, and we follow along. And as we are following along in his steps to holiness, we are crucifying the remnant, those old sinful cravings in our hearts. And along the way, we will notice that we are becoming more and more like Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. What, what image is that? That's, that's Jesus. The glory of the Lord, Paul says. So as we behold Jesus, we become like Jesus. And the one who conforms us into the very image of Jesus is the Spirit. So are you keeping in step with him? Are you this morning following his lead in your life? Are you obeying him, following him? Are you waging war against the flesh with its sinful cravings and sinful desires this morning? The Apostle Paul in verse 26 makes immediate practical application of what it means to be keeping in step with the Spirit, and it's to that that we'll look next week. Let's pray. Father, this morning we have seen so clearly the need for us to follow the Spirit's lead in our life, and we see chiefly here, at least in Galatians 5, 24 through 25, that following the Spirit's lead, keeping in step with Him, means crucifying the flesh, means going to war with the sin and, and evil cravings in our lives. So Father, help us this morning to, to love and value and treasure holiness. Help us to see and live out a, a, a life where we go to war against the sin and conform to you, not out of duty, but out of delight. Help us to, to not try to will ourselves into this, work harder, do better, pray harder, but, but rather instead to live in the freedom of the Spirit, to live in this newfound reality that we are united to your Son by the Spirit. So Father, as we seek to follow the Spirit's leading, as we seek to, to keep in step with Him, help us to wage war against these flesh with its sinful desires, with its sinful cravings. We want to be more like Jesus. So help us to this end, we pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen.